Hello. This screencast is of Horace's poem, The Carmen Seculare. I'm not going to be doing a lecture on this particular poem in terms of it being a literary text so much as looking at its historical significance and why it is so important in terms of acting as a propaganda vehicle for Augustus's power and prestige and auctoritas. So as we know, it is written in 17 BCE, and it's written to coincide with the secular games, and it is written to Phoebus or Diana and Apollo. It is a prayer that was, it's a lyric poem, sung by 27 maidens and 27 boys, all magnificently dressed in white. And surrounding this, was a whole series of sacrifices and religious ceremonies that made this a very reverential occasion. And I think it's very important if we're looking at Augustus's religious and moral status and authority to see this as a crowning moment within this. Now we know that it was very important to have writers working to celebrate Augustus's majesty, and of course his pietas, which is an idea that we're gonna see in the literature a great deal and that I'm gonna to touch on. So what I'm gonna do is flip through different verses of the poem to show their significance. So the poem is written in terms of quatrains. It is a, um, as I said, it is a lyric poem, so it is sung. And it would have been an incredible sight, I think, being at the secular games with these 54 young people singing it, dressed in white, giving a sense of this new kind of moral regeneration of Rome. This idea that we see in Res Gestae, that Augustus has taken us back to the kind of high moral standards of the ancestors. And it begins with him talking about the bright heavenly glories of this sacred time. And I think, yes, I really want to emphasize that these games were seen as sacred. Again, we see the Sibylline verses have issued their warning. We know that Augustus loves to see himself as a protector of the rituals and of the history of Rome. And this once again is positioning himself in this way. Many people would see him as a innovator, possibly even a destroyer of the Republic, but in official propaganda, he likes to show himself as enjoying a kind of continuity with the traditions of Rome and being more of a restorer of the traditions of the Republic rather than a destroyer of them. So we have these beautiful, innocent boys and girls singing out to the, uh, to the gods their love for the seven hills, of course, We'll go into the seven hills in a lot more detail in a moment. And he goes on to say, O kindly sun, in your shining chariot, who herald the day. Now, of course, this is Apollo, who has particular significance to Augustus. He's recently finished the magnificent temple of Apollo. Of Apollo. And so this all connects. And what we'll see in this poem is the connection to all of the divine and historical beings who support Augustus and who he claims that he has some kind of lineage or relationship to. And this quatrain ends with, herald the day, then hide it to be born again. Yet, the same, you will never know anything mightier than Rome. Now this is very important because we're gonna see in the literature in particular, a growing imperial consciousness as Rome realizes that it has moved from a kind of Republican city-state to being a mighty kind of global empire. And this is a celebration of this new narrative. This very much connects to the Aeneid, which we're going to do next, with these global ambitions that are now occurring and we will see in Roman art, we will see this celebrated in Res Gestae and by a number of Roman historians as well. Of particular importance in this poem is the pride of place 
given to childbirth and midwifery. Okay, so here we have Alethea, the goddess of childbirth and midwifery. Uh, we also have a, um, a reference to, uh, let me just get this here, to Lucina, who sometimes is represented as Juno, other times Diana. But the important thing is that this is the goddess of midwifery. And this connects very much to the laws at the time that Augustus is pushing through the Senate, which we call the Lex Julia, that really encourage a period of childbearing and fertility. This is absolutely key to the Augustan age, this idea of growing the population and it being your patriotic duty to have children. Now, I'm just briefly going to bring in the idea of the Arapacus, because one of the things that we'll see is there's a careful coordination between the visual arts and the literary arts. And here we have the figure of Ceres, the goddess of fertility with all of these children and this whole idea of plenty that we're going to see that is taken up by historians and poets like Paterculus and this idea that Augustus has brought in an age of extraordinary fertility and happiness and abundance, a kind of cornucopia and that he has brought peace back to Rome after the chaos of the years of civil war and the prescriptions, etc. This poem goes on to say, Goddess, nurture our offspring, bring to fruition the Senate's decrees. Very interesting because we know that in Res Gestae there are 27 references to the Senate. And once again here, we see that Horace, the poet, is cooperating with the res gestae idea that the Senate and Augustus work as one, that they are perfectly coordinated. In the words of Mommsen, the great historian Mommsen, they are a diarchy. Now, of course, the reality might be very different, and this might explain why the great poet and translator John Dryden called Horace a well-mannered court slave because he saw his poetry as effectively propaganda rather than it being beautiful art. Now, moving on to uh, page two. Here we have the reference to the fact that it is going to be 110 years, which we call the seculum, the idea that this is the age that the oldest person could reach. And once again, I think it's very important to emphasize when we look at res gestae, that Augustus is constantly seeing himself as a person who brings back the traditions that have been lost, that he is a restorer, not a creator or an innovator. And here he, we go on in the next quatrain, and you, the fates, who are truthful in prophecy. There's a huge emphasis in this poem and the Aeneid on the idea that the coming of Augustus is like a prophecy that he is the culmination of a great history, that Rome has arrived. So it's very much a teleological account in which Augustus is seen as the great person. And if we're assessing Augustus, we need to think to ourselves that that is actually how many historians do see this age. And later, when people speak of an Augustan age, they mean that it's the absolute zenith that that particular society reaches. Here again, we go to the earth that is fruitful in crops and cattle. I'll just point out that in terms of the Arapacus, this is a coloured version of it. We have this beautiful sense of these lovely ferns, this huge emphasis upon fecundity, on childbearing, on plenty, etc. Once again, on the idea of reproduction. So this is a trope that goes throughout the poem. It's very important. And it goes together with this idea of agricultural plenty. Now, we know that when we look at one of our sources, the historian Paterculus celebrates this. And he agrees with Horace and this whole account that Augustus has bought plenty, that the land has awakened, that the terrible days of the prescription are over. The land is flowering. Famine is dead. And this poem celebrates this idea that this kind of holiness and this orderliness that Augustus has brought 
has ended in this wonderful age of plenty. Once again, we see that it is addressed to Apollo, here uh, Luna or uh, Diana. Again, so this idea of piety, this idea of addressing the gods with reverence is very important. Now, importantly, in this quatrain, if Rome is your doing and far from Ilium, now this is going to be very important in terms of um, cross-referencing this with the Aeneid, because the story of Troy, or Ilium as it's called here, is going to be really important. And in the Augustan age, it becomes the most important foundation myth. It becomes far more important than Romulus, which after all is a rather brutal story of fratricide. And of course, Romulus goes on to be a king. Far better to have the story of Aeneas, who escapes Troy and is a wonderful leader, an incredible man, an incredible son to his father, and also a remarkable journeyer who founds this extraordinary new Latium or Rome. So this is very important and we will be looking at this uh, really carefully. So I think it's, I'd like to emphasize that both Horace and Virgil agree in this kind of depiction of the importance of Troy. Now, why might that be the case? Well, we know that we have the culture minister in the background, Mycenas, and that he is coordinating a lot of the art and the poetry at the time, and he is making sure that all of the mythology lines up just beautifully. Now, on to the next page. Again, we have a reference here to Pius Aeneas, and this is going to be a quality, the quality of Pietas, that Augustus wishes to attach to himself. So Aeneas becomes a kind of an archetype for a wonderful, pious Roman who suffers, etc. And that is going to be a kind of trope that Augustan uh, propagandists are going to use for Augustus himself. So there's this brilliant mirroring between the figure of Aeneas and the figure of Augustus. And to make it more contemporary, we know that in the past, uh, uh, that Aeneas remarkably escapes from Troy, here the civil war becomes the terrible backdrop to Augustus's path, which is equally heroic as he gets through Actium and the wickedness of Cleopatra and Antony so that he can take Rome into this golden age. So this parallelism is really, really important, okay? There is a reference here, interestingly, to Romulus, but you will notice uh, in most of the literature that the figure of Romulus becomes less important and the figure of Aeneas is far more valuable in uh, propaganda terms. Here is a reference to Anchises, who is the father of um, Aeneas. And what is so interesting about um, Anchises and Aeneas is that this kind of relationship mirrors the way in which Augustus liked to be seen as Diva Filius, as this extraordinary dutiful son who carries on the legacy of his wronged father. So I think there again is another really interesting parallel. And now uh, another interesting thing about uh, Augustus's rebranding, if we think about the Octavian that Suetonius tells us about, who's quite a, a terrifying and vengeful person. Here, the new Augustus is a man of Clementia, isn't he? And the whole imperial project, the whole depiction of Rome, really moves towards empire as a form of civilization and the Roman people as bringing peace. Now, this is very important in terms of this whole idea of the Pax Augusta. And in terms of uh, res gestae, we'd want to link to the mention of the closing of the gates of the Temple of Janus, which is seen again as so symbolically important of this new age of prosperity and peace that Augustus has brought. Now, very importantly, this, phrase, this particular quatrain, now I'm going to go into a lot of detail. Now the Parthians fear our forces. This is very, very important. It's also beautifully reproduced in the Prima Porta, in the breastplate, where we can see the Parthian king returning the standards 
that were taken by the Parthians after they successfully defeated both Crassus and Mark Antony on two occasions. And they here are in a kind of supplicatory position, giving these standards back to what appears to be Tiberius. And really, this is a symbolic kind of victory for Rome. Even though it's not a military victory, it has been depicted as such. This Parthian king is compelled to give the standards back. And what does uh, Horace tell us in the Carmen Seculare? He says that uh, the Parthians fear our forces. Now, it's interesting, of course, because Augustus doesn't defeat them in battle. And it kind of confirms the idea that Augustus was a, uh, a cautious commander rather than a bold one, and that he would also use politics and political ag agreements in addition to war. I think it does show the importance of diplomacy for Augustus, and I think it speaks to his wisdom, to be honest with you. Here, they fear our Alban axes, going back to the kings of Albion, the earliest founders of Rome. This sort of looks uh, at the Aeneid as well, and this glorious, rich history that they're always emphasizing about Rome. And in addition to the Parthians feeling very fearful, now the once proud Indians. Interestingly enough, we know now that Rome was actually trading with India at the time. And so there were more connections than a lot of people realized. So the Indians and the, and the Scythians are both terrified of Rome. And even though Rome hasn't gone and defeated them, uh, we know from Res Gestae that they tell us that they send tributes and effectively supplicate themselves to Rome. So this seems to be part of this kind of idea of a Roman global presence. I think it's really interesting that Agrippa is one of the first people in Rome to have a map of the world in the Porticus Vipsania. And this map of Rome really shows Rome at being the center of the earth as being a true global power, as moving away from representing itself as a republic. And um, once again, I think it's really important. Now faith and peace, honor and ancient modesty dare return once more. So what has Augustus brought? He has brought decency back to Rome. And now onto the final page of the poem. We've seen not only is Augustus the great believer in Roman traditions, and as I say here, the Mos Maiorum, the ways of the ancestors, he is also a bringer of peace. And so in this particular verse, may Phoebus the augur decked with the shining bow, Phoebus who's dear to the nine muses, who can offer relief to a weary body with his healing art. Well, we know that Augustus frequently likes to compare himself with Apollo and dressed as Apollo, we, if, when we look back, we'll remember that Mark Antony was associated with Dionysus and um, that Octavian preferred to be associated with Apollo. He too likes to cast himself as a healer. We can see that with the Arapacus that we looked at earlier. We know that in the Res Gestae, where he boasts of having the gates of Janus, the Temple of Janus, closed on three occasions. And this, of course, is the famous Pax Augusta. So once again, Augustus here being associated with healing Rome after the trauma of the civil wars, after the final battle of Actium, making Rome whole again. May he again, Apollo, if he favours the Palatine, well, Augustus's home is on the Palatine, extend Rome's power. And again, this is the imperial call and Latium's good fortune. Latium being going back in time. So again, connecting to the Aeneid and to this rich, extraordinary history of Rome that goes back to Troy. Uh, the good fortune through the fresh ages show always improvement. Lustra ever new. So again, this idea of renewal that goes to the Arapacus, that goes to so much of the iconography of Augustus's time. And then to the other hill of Rome, to the Aventine, which is dedicated to the Temple of, of Diana, not the Temple of Apollo this time, and to Mount Elgidus, which was a famous victory for the Romans. Again, there's always a lot of listing 
of great moments in history that get associated with the present, accept the entreaties of the fifteen and attend and lend a fond ear to these children's prayers. So again, a real insistence on pietas. And we'll see in the depictions of Augustus and many of the statues that he's often cloaked, that he is a figure of pietas himself, a figure who closely aligns, as I said, with Aeneas. And now the coda of the poem. We bear to our home the fine hope and certain that such is Jupiter's king of the gods and all the gods purpose. We have, we're taught, we, the chorus, to sing praise of Phoebus and to sing praise of Diana. So again, I just want to end by saying this extraordinary occasion, this wonderful secular games with these 54 children decked in white singing this highly reverential hymn that shows the glory of the past, but above all, celebrates the return to all that is good in Rome and all that Augustus has brought. And this is part of this whole propaganda network of showing the great benefits of the Princeps' rule. And Horace, along with Virgil, is going to be extremely important in terms of extending Augustus's soft power, his auctoritas, and ensuring that the general representation of him is as a bringer of fertility, a returner to past glories, and a man who will secure the future for this new, extraordinary, extensive empire, which is now Rome. Thanks for listening.